Hello, Mark Lowdy here at IPBC Global 2014 in Amsterdam. During one of the discussions earlier today in the plenary sessions, uh, particularly focusing on Chief Intellectual Property Officer, we heard this comment. What we're talking about here is the spray and pray model and or versus the strategic model. So it's the spray and pray model. You have lots of inventions. You have an invention disclosure program. You file lots of cheap patents. And you hope and pray that something is going to hit. That's great. You tell your CEO, I filed all these patent applications. I, the CEOs like to talk about how many patents they've got. The problem is, is those things cost a massive amount of money with renewals. So now what you have to do is you've got to get rid of these assets. So either you're going to kill them, year 10, because they're too expensive, you're just going to let them go abandoned, or alternatively, you're going to sell them. And guess who you're going to sell them to? You're going to sell them to the NPEs. This is what it's equivalent in weapons of war. You're manufacturing a lot of AK-47s, and you're putting them out on the street. You're not going to bring down a big country like the United States with a bunch of AK-47s, but hell, they do a lot of damage. And the person who you heard there was Craig Opperman, who's the general counsel at NASPERS, one of the largest media companies outside of the US and China with a market cap of around $45 billion. So you would expect him to know exactly what he's talking about. Thanks so much for coming here today, Craig. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So when you describe you know, the low quality of patents uh, and liken that to a, a machine gun approach to patenting, um, clearly this is something that you feel very strongly about. What, what's the motivation for that comment earlier today? Well, the, the question that was posed to us as a group was, um, do you go for quality or do you go for quantity? And I am on record in many places of saying I'm passionate about quality. So Evidently. quality is really, really important to me. I worry about um, people who create um, a mythology around large patent portfolios to say they have lots and lots of patents and therefore it'll give them protection. And as, as I said in my uh, remarks, the problem with too many patents are one, they cost a lot of money in the long run. Every patent has uh, government maintenance fees that need to be paid every year uh, in, in most of the world, every four years in the United States. And those fees increase every year or every time you have to pay them. So imagine you have a thousand patents or two thousand patents or three thousand patents. Those numbers become um, exponentially large towards the back end. So from a cost benefit point of view, that's the first problem I have. The second problem I have is that because of the tremendous cost, companies are now being forced to get rid of all these what they would call dead wood or not useful patents or patents. The problem that that creates is my AK-47 comment, which is that companies are now selling off these patents to what we call trolls or non-practicing entities. So effectively, they are fueling this industry that's getting so much criticism in the media today. These big companies, the Motorola's of the world, etc., etc., are taking their patents handing them over for you know, a certain amount of money to uh, enforcement entities who then go out and sue everyone and uh, create the level of anxiety we're seeing in the United States. So effectively you're creating a cheap, nasty weapon that when it's in the hands of somebody else um, can be quite damaging. And not fatal to, to countries or, or major companies, but really, really quite a lot of pain. Hence my analogy of an AK-47. But, so the, that, but the counter-argument is that there are entrepreneurs, people who've invested, who've maybe mortgaged their home to develop intellectual property. Shouldn't they have their patent rights protected? Oh, I'm a very strong believer in strong patents. No question about it. And my comment had to do with big companies producing big, cheap portfolios, which they then take large chunks of and hand them over to the non-practicing entities. The individuals, and I in my private practice represented many of these folks and am and, and passionate about these people, the individuals or the small companies that are truly innovative, and then they patent that technology, and then maybe they fall on hard times and the only way they can make money for their shareholders is to enforce their, their, their patented rights, it's an entirely different person, and I, that was not what my comment was about. My comment was absolutely about high volume, low quality patenting and the problems that are associated with it. I call it the spray and pray model when it comes to protection. You, you just spray a lot of stuff, hope something sticks. Statistically, yeah. that's a very difficult thing to manage successfully. At the same time, though, you obviously being in the media business, you have a take on patents unlike probably everybody else here at the conference, because the media is in the business of developing intellectual property as a matter of course every single day in your publications and in your broadcasts. So to what extent do you feel just as strongly about 
poor quality television or poor quality newspapers perhaps not should not enjoy the same level of protection as the high quality programs that you produce. That's an interesting way of putting it. So just by background, we are a hundred year old media business. So we effectively founded on intellectual property, There's, in that case with copyright, copyright in media. And we've got big pay TV businesses, as you say. And there, of course, it's intellectual property rights, you know, copyright in, in, in movies, uh, primarily. And then we have big internet businesses, and so we have technology there, and that's traditionally protected by copyright and trade secret and a bit of and, and, and patent law. Coming back to the question about poor quality uh, media, well we obviously pride ourselves as being a, a high quality media business, but it, that doesn't change the, the underlying copyright. Whether it's poor quality or uh, good quality reporting doesn't change the underlying copyright. And the reason for that is that copyright subsists in exactly the thing you wrote. So if I go and copy your good photograph or I copy your bad photograph, equally I've infringed copyright. And the patent world is different because uh, poor quality patents are um, you know, a dime a dozen, they, they lie around, they cause a lot of problems for people. But copyright is a, an entirely different mm. right because patents can be infringed innocently while copyright cannot. You can only infringe copyright by copying someone. Yes, but are you thinking of then becoming just as litigious in protecting your copyright when it comes to content aggregation or curation? As you say, the trolls are in, uh, you know, extracting value out of low quality paint. Yeah, actually, that's, that's a, another good question. We are faced in South Africa with an aggregation uh, lawsuit. So aggregation is a situation where you get um, news information or maybe for a story from different sources and you weave together your own story based on those pieces of, of information. And in globally, the UK, Australia, the US, and now South Africa, where we involve this question of, of content aggregation and whether you are or aren't infringing copyright is a cutting, leading edge um, kind of question in, in, the legal, yes. in the legal world. And we've Most seen of Rupert Murdoch tried to uh, take Google on for the same reason. Exactly, we? exactly. And, and we had the Huffington Post, um, you know, fights with the New York Times and, and things like that. Um, so we are actually involved in that. In this particular case, we are on the receiving end of the accusation that our people um, aggregated um, unfairly, is the test, um, from, from another source. Now our position, of course, is, uh, is a matter of public record in court filings that uh, there is no copyright in facts and uh, you know, figures and those types of things, and that we didn't do anything wrong because we, we're fairly careful about other people's intellectual property rights and our entire business is around intellectual property, so we're pretty careful. Being general counsel at a media company obviously also exposes you to a variety of intellectual property beyond the, the spoken word, the printed word. Uh, what about the customer data that particularly your e-commerce sites collect? To what extent should that be brought under the same umbrella as the copyright aspects of your business or patents that you might have? Or should that remain with, let's say, the privacy commissioner or the marketing department? Uh, also, I think, uh, uh, quite an astute question. The, the question of data is, is, um, is uh, they're two different camps. Uh, data is, a, is an intangible asset, so theoretically it's a type of intellectual property. And should it therefore be part of the chief intellectual property officer's uh, domain, so to speak? The problem with that is that most companies have chief privacy officers whose business it is to make sure the data is not managed incorrectly, sh that customers' rights, privacy rights in different countries are not infringed, etc. So in, in that respect, data privacy officers got to manage that part of it. Then, of course, we have the data breach problem, which is a uh, se chief security officer or chief information officer's problem. And then we have this intangible asset. Once it's across the wall, once it's in this safe space inside the company, who then is in charge of making sure that when you sell that? that well, the, a lot of chief intellectual property officers don't want to deal with that. And the reason why they don't want to deal with that is it's a very complicated problem to deal with, and they have enough complicated problems already. I mean, but, is, but who else could handle them? Well, I'm a believer that it, it is part of legal, and I'm a strong believer that ultimately data is going to be part of the Chief Intellectual Property Officer's um, domain, absolutely, because it is becoming one of the biggest and most valuable intangible assets in many of these com companies. But if you had to make any concessions to that argument, because as you said, IP officers are already very busy with other things. If you had to admit that there are faults in this assertion, what would it be? 
Well, in the, under the Greater Chief Intellectual Property Officers and it, we have trademark attorneys who are in charge of the trademarks and the branding. And branding and trademarks often fall inside marketing. So you could argue that maybe data should really belong to the Chief Privacy Officer. Or maybe if it's big data, it belongs to marketing. I think that in time, that is going to become a very interesting area for us to look at. I still believe it's an intangible asset. It belongs in with the people who are most affair with dealing with intangible assets. And right now, those are the chief IP officers. Perhaps or that's the, a topic of discussion that we'll pick up at the next. Exactly. We'll have it on the next, uh, the the next, next IPBC, IPBC uh, Global Conference. Thanks so much for coming here today. Sure. You're Craig, very welcome. Thank Craig Opperman from NASPERS here at the IPBC Global 2014 in Amsterdam.